thank you, and uh, good to see you again. <laughs> Are you ready for more? <laughs> All right. So we are talking about different continents of mathematics, and we are talking about hidden connections between them. So let me recap what we have uh, discussed up to now. So we remember that picture of, of these different continents and the jigsaw puzzle, and this idea that we have different continents of mathematics. And the ones we have talked about so far are number theory, the study of numbers, and uh, things like Galois groups, algebraic equations, etc., counting problem, elliptic curves, and so on. Harmonic analysis, we talked about the waves such as the ones represented by trigonometric functions as the ones which correspond to, say, the sounds of musical instruments, but also more sophisticated ones corresponding to the so-called modular forms. They are the ones which turn out to be responsible for the counting problems, for counting the numbers of solutions of uh, the cubic equations, which we talked about last time. And we have also talked about geometry and the appearance of symmetry groups uh, in geometric settings. So the Langlands program, initiated by Robert Langlands, pictured here at his office at the Institute for Advanced Study, aims to unify these continents of mathematics, aims, aims at building bridges between them, finding connections between them. And this is not just a kind of a metaphysical, philosophical discussion. These connections are expressed by some very concrete mathematical statements, like the shimura tanyama Vey conjecture, which we discussed last time. Very precise mathematical statement. So here's again this cover page of the letter from Robert Langlands to Andre Vey in 1967, in which he first outlined these ideas, almost 50 years ago. But of course, a lot of progress has been made in those years, and still so much remains unsolved. The Langlands program itself, one could say, uh, essentially, essentially consists of two parts. One is called the Langlands correspondence, and it can be thought of as really a vast generalization of the shimura tanyama Vey conjecture, which we talked about last time. That conjecture which relates objects of totally different nature from number theory and from harmonic analysis. The Langlands correspondence is a generalization of that. On one side are representations of Galois groups. So you see the Galois group is very important in this discussion. And in fact, when you look at this photograph of Langlands, you see that Galois group, Galois theory appears prominently on this blackboard behind him. So that's not, a, that's not by, by chance. Galois theory is very important. And on the other side are the so-called automorphic functions, which are the characters living in the world of harmonic analysis. And the second idea is the so-called Langlands functor reality. And this is something which is just about the world of harmonic analysis. It's about some non-trivial relations between those automorphic functions. That's what the Langlands program, it's sort of like a panoramic view of the Langlands program. And now to connect to what we discussed last time, let me remind you that the shimura tanyama Vey conjecture could be thought of as a correspondence, as a correspondence between objects from number theory, which can be represented by cubic equations, or mathematicians also know them as elliptic curves, on one side, and objects from harmonic analysis called modular forms. Those are the functions on the unit disk which have the special properties. I have illustrated this connection, this correspondence, in one specific case. When I had the one specific equation, remember this equation, y squared, plus y equals x cubed minus x squared. Did I write it correctly? <laughs> yes, okay. This equation and the corresponding counting problem and the corresponding elliptic curve and then on the other side, the modular form which appears is that special one which was written as uh, q squared or minus q squared 
squared, and so on. So, but this is just one case. This is just one member on the left-hand side and one member on the right-hand side. The statement is that every other elliptic curve would have its own partner, which will be a modular form, perhaps more sophisticated than the one which I wrote. Now, the Langlois correspondence is a more general statement like that. It's also correspondence between objects of two different nature, uh, one object from number theory, one from harmonic analysis. But the objects which appear in number theory, they are not represented necessarily by some equations. They are actually rather represented by something related to the Galois groups. So you see the Galois groups are actually, they play the central role in the Langlands program. The reason why, in this special case of Ashimura tanyama Way conjecture, the reason why we can actually rephrase things without mentioning Galois group is because these numbers of solutions, which we talk about, could be, uh, could substitute some other numbers which appear from Galois groups. So it's kind of a, a, a way to rephrase the conjecture so that we cannot, we don't have to mention Galois groups, but just mention the counting problem. But in general, instead of considering counting of solutions, we consider what mathematicians call representations of Galois groups. And the other side, we have objects of harmonic analysis which generalize modular forms. They are called automorphic functions. That's what the Langlands correspondence is about. And so this idea is in, essentially was already uh, con contained in, in that letter, in that letter from uh, Langlands to Andre Wey, which he wrote in 1967. But of course, since that time, a lot has happened. We have been able to, mathematicians have been able to, to prove these conjectures in many cases. But I would say that still, we don't really know why such a correspondence should hold. And to me, it's really one of the wonders of the world, as I said. It is something really kind of magical, which still waits for its explanation. And I'm sure we will find this explanation. That's what, but the kind of, this is what gives mathematicians the, the impetus, the motivation to study these problems. It's really to get to the heart of the matter, to really understand what is the meaning, what is the essence, what is behind uh, this, uh, this uh, unexpected, surprising connections that we have discovered. So now, this uh, conjecture, this Langlands conjectures, have been, in the last 50 years, reformulated in many different settings and generalized in different directions. But there is one direction which I would like to talk about more specifically, and that's the, uh, uh, the connection to quantum physics. So you see, we have uh, already uh, discussed the connection between number theory and harmonic analysis. And in fact, it turns out that geometry is not far, so far away. There, is also, uh, there are also Langlands patterns in geometry. But what perhaps is even more surprising is that there is yet another continent, or maybe a whole different planet of physics, which also has a, a, a surprising connection to the ideas of the Langlands program. And that's, that, and that's quantum physics. So what I would like to do now is to give you some hints and some ideas, some insights as to what exactly is happening in physics that bears uh, a connection to, uh, a resemblance and connections to the Langlands program. What I like about this subject is that actually it is something which happened just in the last 10 years. It's some really cutting edge research, which, you know, if I was speaking about this 10 years ago, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you the story. But now, the story can be told. And so, it is something very contemporary, very modern, very uh, exciting, something happening right now. There are hundreds of researchers around the world who are working on this problem of connecting the language program and quantum physics. So, to set the stage, to set the stage, for this exploration, I would like to return to our, our old friend, symmetry. Symmetry has been a kind of a secret ingredient in this whole story, a secret ingredient appearing in different guises in all of these different continents of mathematics. We saw its appearance in, uh, in uh, geometry first. Remember the, the snowflake, but also 
Uh, we talked about rotations of a bottle, and other round objects, rotations of a sphere, permutation groups, things like that. That's symmetry in geometry. We also talked about number theory. And we talked about um, the Galois groups invented by, discovered by the great uh, French mathematician who died so young, and which we still you know, use to this day, and which are the central objects of number theory today. And uh, we have now talked about symmetries also in harmonic analysis, because we've discussed the fact that the functions like this infinite product, which appear on the other side of the uh, shimur tanyama Bay conjecture, actually have special properties with respect to some symmetry groups. I did not describe those symmetry groups precisely, only showed you the picture of how the symmetry group acts on a unit disk. It acts by permuting in, in sophisticated ways these triangles, the white and red triangles. So therefore, the ob these objects, these mysterious objects, modular forms, which appear in shimur tanyama Bay conjecture, and also they are cousins, automorphic functions, which appear in, uh, in the more general setting of the Langlands program. They are intimately connected to symmetry groups. And so what I would like to do now is to show you how symmetry also pops up in quantum physics. So that, you know, this has been the, this kind of like a, um, a, the continuing discussion that this is a secret ingredient. This is something which appears in all of the subjects. And so before kind of getting to quantum field theory proper, I would like to illustrate how the ideas of symmetry play out in quantum physics. Now, yeah, well, that I already explained. <laughs> and, uh, oh, maybe, uh, maybe since I was asked during the break, maybe I should say that, um, I didn't quite explain uh, the, um, the link between, I didn't finish explaining the link between Fermat's last theorem and Shimur uh, Tanyama Wei, right? Because I did explain to you that if there is a solution of the Fermat equation, then we can construct some elliptic curve, some cubic equation, which does not satisfy the Shimur Tanyama Wei conjecture, right? So now I just wanted to write the formula for it. But to write the formulas, there is a clash of notation because I use x, y in the Fermat's last theorem and I use also x, y in the cubic equation. So let me rewrite Fermat's last theorem first as a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n. So let, let's ignore this, but instead focus on this equation. And so if we have an, uh, a solution in positive integers, a, b, c of this equation, for, for a prime number greater than three, then we can construct the following uh, cubic equation. Um, following cubic equation, y squared equals x times x minus a to the n times x minus b to the n. You see, this is called, sometimes it's called the Fry curve because Fry, mathematician Gerhard Fry was the first one to point out that uh, this that if you have such a solution, this curve will probably not um, satisfy shimura tanyama Bay conjecture. And then Ken Ribbit, the Berkeley mathematician, our colleague, actually proved that this curve, this equation, will not satisfy shimura tanyama Bay conjecture. In other words, for this curve, if A and B come from such a solution, could not possibly have a counterpart in the world of harmonic analysis. But therefore, if we already know that shimura tanyama conjecture is true, this curve cannot exist. But if it cannot exist, then the solution cannot exist in the first place. And that's how the proof of Fermat's last theorem was finally completed. So now you see the big picture. You see not only that how shimura tanyama way conjecture how it appears as a special case of the Langlands program, but you also see how Fermat's last theorem is the uh, corollary or is something that is implied by Shimur Tanyama Wei. Okay. But let's go back to the main line of, my, of the discussion, which is that I would like to show you how symmetry works out in quantum physics now. That's, that is my next topic. 
And this basically is this basically is uh, goes back just to the structure of atoms and elementary particles. So of course we all know that you know all matter, all, uh, all matter consists of atoms, and we also know that every atom has a nucleus and electrons which orbit around the nucleus. The nucleus itself consists of protons and, nu and neutrons. So here's a picture of the carbon atom, where you see the protons, uh, six protons, six nu neutrons, and six electrons. These three particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons, were long believed to be elementary, indivisible. Well, it turns out that it's only true, as far as we know, for electrons. But protons and neutrons can be further divided. There exist small, they contain inside small constituents. And what I would like to explain is how physicists first came up with this idea that there exists the smaller consistency, the constituents inside protons and neutrons, something which appeared completely, which kind of stunned the world of physics. You know, these days, physicists need uh, very sophisticated machines to find, to find elementary particles and to understand their properties. So here you see the picture of the famous Large Hadron Collider, uh, which is probably the biggest um, machine ever built by humans under the city of Geneva um, in, uh, in Switzerland. And actually, it's, sort of, it's so big that actually it crosses the uh, international borders, as you may know. And so this, this humongous machine, what happens is the particles get accelerated, and then they smash together which is kind of schematically represented in this picture. And uh, this $10 billion machine was used to discover uh, a very important elementary particle called the Higgs boson three years ago in 2012, which is a very important ingredient of what's called the standard model of elementary particles, which we'll talk about in more detail a little bit later. But what I would like to tell you now is that I want, to go, I want to go back in time to the 1960s. In the 1960s, physicists used smaller machines, still quite impressive, but not quite as big as, as, a, uh, as a large Hadron Collider. And using those sophisticated machines, in particular here at Berkeley, um, uh, at the Lawrence Lab, they were able to discover a very large number of what was believed to be elementary particles. And at first, physicists were very excited that look, we find this particle and this particle, and, and more and more Nobel Prizes were given for this. But then, in some sense, it became kind of an embarrassment because there were too many of them. To the point where famous theoretical physicist Wolfgang Pauli, a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner, quipped that elementary particle physics was turning into botany. You have too many particles and uh, no underlying theory describing this proliferation, this humongous proliferation of those particles. Physicists desperately needed some theory, some explanation where these particles come from. Or, as another physicist said, who ordered them? Who ordered those particles? And this explanation, lo and behold, was provided by group theory. It was the ideas of symmetry that enabled the physicists to have a beautiful, conceptual theory of the origins of this large number of, of particles. The, the physicist who played a crucial role in these developments was Maury Gell-Mann. In 1961, he used the, the group called SU3, and we'll, we'll talk about the meaning of that term, to classify hadrons as elementary particles. In 1964, he used this theory to predict the existence of quarks. Quarks are the elementary particles which turn out to be the small constituents inside proton, neutron, and many other elementary particles. The particles which were comp uh, sort of completely unbelievable. For one thing, he predicted that they have fractional electric charge, a fraction of the charge of an electron. And such particles would never observe. 
physicists uh, ran lots of experiments and never, saw, never seen such particles. So this idea looked completely crazy at the time. You're predicting some particles which no one has ever seen, and yet they follow from some kind of mathematical theory. Can it really be true? Well, it turns out it is actually true. And now we know that the proton and neutron each consists of three quarks. Gelman actually theorized that there are, th there are uh, three types of quarks, which he called up, down, and strange. Um, proton and neutron only contain up and down quarks. Uh, the neutron has one up quark and two down, and the proton has two up quarks and one down. The reason why we don't see isolated quarks, quarks by themselves, is very deep and still not fully understood. It is related to what physicists refer to as confinement. The point is that unlike other forces of nature, such as electromagnetic force or, or the force of gravity, which we experience in our day-to-day -day lives, the force which binds the quarks together in proton, neutron, and other elementary particles has a very peculiar behavior. It becomes stronger as they uh, get separated. And that is the reason why we never see them by themselves, but only in groups, such as a group of three in a proton and neutron. So other elementary particles also consist of quarks. By the way, the term quark, that was a term which Gelman came up with as well. And it came from a novel, uh, Finnegan's Wake, by James Joyce. So I remember when I was a kid, I was very curious about all the stuff. I was really excited about elementary particles and quantum physics. I read popular books about that. And this was one thing which really kind of stuck in my mind, that here's a physicist. And at that time, I thought the physicists are all supposed to be, scientists supposed to be the sort of outwardly creatures who are not interested in anything but science. And here is this guy, Murray Gelman, who actually gives a name to an elementary particle based on a famous work of literature. So I find it kind of encouraging so that maybe it's not such a bad idea to read and to be interested in other subjects like art and literature and poetry, etc. So the, in the Finnegan's Wake, he has, there, is a, there is a poem which starts with the words, three quarks for Master Mark. And that's where, that's where the name that's where the name came from. I should say, uh, some of these ideas were also developed by other physicists, including uh, the Japanese physicist Kazuhika Nishijima, Israeli uh, Yuval Neumann, and American uh, George Zweig, Russian-born uh, physicist. But the crucial element in Gelman's theory is a group, which is called SU3. Now, what is the meaning of this, uh, what is the meaning of this name? You see, uh, we have discussed uh, uh, a very important uh, group, which is a group of rotations, um, a group of rotations of a sphere, for which I use basketball. Actually, I might as well show you again. So, we have discussed the group of rotations of a sphere, right? So, you choose an axis of rotation and you rotate by a particular angle. That group has a special name in mathematics. It's called SO3. So I'm trying to explain the names, you see. Some names are kind of cool, like quark, and some names are less cool, like SO3 or SU3, but, <laughs> but there is something behind them. So SO3 stands for Special Orthogonal Group. In three dimensions. Why three dimensions? Because the sphere is in three dimensions. So each rotation of a sphere can also be thought of as the rotation of the ambient three-dimensional space, which has special properties. It's called orthogonal. It preserves all distances. Special means that it preserves orientation, something we also talked about uh, in, during the first lecture. SU3 is, is a special unitary group. in three dimensions. So you see, here S and O give rise to SO, and here S and U give rise to SU. So it is kind of similar. The difference is that you replace a real three-dimensional space, like the space which we live in, 
by the complex three-dimensional space. So it's based on complex numbers rather than real numbers. So SU3 is a group which is kind of a complex analog of the, of the <clears throat> SU3 is a complex analog of, this, of the group of rotations of a sphere. Now, why, how on earth could this gr group be connected to elementary particles? Well, the first step was Gilman's and other physicists' realization that you could place elementary particles into families. There were families of eight and there were families of 10. Here is an example of a family of eight where you can find the familiar proton and neutron as well as six other particles. And there was a reason to put them in this diagram because uh, th there were two axes, which is the isospin and the strangeness. And if you place particles with corresponding coordinates, they form this beautiful diagram. And then what Gelman realized is that it looked exactly the same as something from a book of mathematicians, which had to do with what mathematicians call the weight diagram of a representation of SU3. And the story is that actually there was a colleague of Gelman at Caltech, where he worked at the time, who showed it to him. And Gelman was smart enough to see the link and ask the question, why? You see, research in mathematics and quantum physics is often like uh, a detective's work. And as a true detective, you try to assemble all evidence, and you try to make the links, and you try to find out who done it, you know, and so. In this case, he realized that it was SU3 who was responsible because the diagram of elementary particles, which he saw, was identical to a diagram appearing in a totally different setting and many years earlier, I might add. So this is, we're talking about the work done in the 60s. Mathematicians worked this out perhaps 20, 30 years earlier, totally unrelated from physics motivated by entirely different reasons. Okay. Which, you know, brings up this quote from um, a great physicist, C.N. Young, a Nobel Prize winner, who has also made important contributions in exploiting this kind of connections between mathematics and physics. He said, what could be more mysterious, what could be more awe-inspiring than to find that the structure of the physical world is intimately tied to the deep mathematical concepts, concepts which were developed out of considerations rooted only in logic and the beauty of form. So that's a beautiful example of um, how this seemingly abstract and theoretical concepts of mathematics appearing out of the consideration of the beauty of form actually turn out to be at the heart of, of, the, of, of all matter, literally at the heart of, of the fundamental blocks of nature. I like the story in part because I suppose I could say that the reason why, why I, I that, that quarks are one of the reasons why I became a mathematician. Quarks are one of the reasons why I became a mathematician. In fact, when I was growing up, I, I didn't like mathematics at all. I thought it was the most boring, <laughs> cold and irrelevant subject because I thought that mathematics was just the kind of stuff we did at school and it wasn't particularly interesting. What I was really excited about was quantum physics. And I read, I read popular books about quarks, about forces of nature, about elementary particles. So I knew about uh, the work of Gelman. I knew that he discovered quarks. I even saw, I even saw in those popular books this diagram without any explanation. And there is such a diagram that you can put elementary particles, organize them in these octets. And that somehow from this, Gelman was able to discern that there exist quarks. But no explanation was ever provided. But so then what happened is just by, as a stroke of luck, a friend of my parents who was a professional mathematician, and I, was, I lived in a small town uh, near Moscow, 
We only had one college in there. And this guy was this brilliant guy was, uh, with a Russian sounding name, Evgeny Evgenievich, the kind of name you would encounter in a Tolstoy novel. You know. He was a mathematician and he wanted to meet with me. And I was kind of reluctant, but when I met with him, he asked me, he said, I know that you're not very fond of mathematics, but what are you interested in? I said, well, I'm very interested in quantum physics. And he said, okay, what do you know about quantum physics? I said, I know about quarks, and about Gelman inventing quarks, and I think it's really fascinating. He said, ah, quarks, okay, but do you know the group SU3? And I said, SU what? <laughs> <laughs> so of course I didn't know, because in the books which, um, which I, I read, there was this diagram, but there was never you know, the other diagram. And I remember that moment when Evgeny Evgenievich pulled out a book from a bookshelf, which was actually a book about the mathematical foundations of quantum physics. And he opened the page where I saw both of these compared, and I could see that there is a coherent theory explaining all of this. Of course, at that time, I couldn't understand the, the details, but it was clear to me that the answer was there. Wow. And he said, Eugene said, you think what you studied at school is mathematics? He said, no, this is mathematics. And if you want to understand elementary particles in quantum physics, you better study mathematics. And so that was a moment when you might say, I fell in love <laughs> with mathematics. So, so that's why I like to tell the story, you know, because it sort of reminds me of my sort of my first love in you know, physics, quantum physics, but also uh, my second love, or <laughs> now maybe first, mathematics. Now, this is a good illustration. This is a good illustration of the role that groups, symmetry groups, play in quantum physics, and how they have been instrumental in our uh, in forging our understanding of the world. By the way. Uh, I, I didn't explain how quarks come out from SU3, but basically the idea is that this three means that if you study representations of this group SU3, you know immediately that it always, behind them, there is always a triple, so to speak. And that's the triple of quarks, up, down, and strange, which uh, Gelman saw as the constituents of matter and which was then experimentally verified plus their antiparticles, plus later on physicists discovered three more quarks called charm, a top and bottom. So uh, don't ask, the <laughs> terminology is strange, but charming. So, so this is just one example, but in fact there is a lot more. And so what connects to, what, the, the way to connect this uh, quantum physics to Langlands program is to talk about the standard model. I already mentioned it. This is, this is the, the model of um, all forces of nature apart from gravity. And it has had a spectacular experimental success in that every particle that had been predicted has been discovered experimentally. Most recently, the Higgs boson at LHC, at the Large Hadron Collider. And so it, but it is not a final theory because for one thing it does not contain, it does not, it does not include gravity, but also there are various issues about what happens at higher energies and so on, but it's a good working model of all the phenomena, phenomena that we can observe at the energies which are, acc are accessible to us today. It's a very important theory. So what are the forces of nature that we are talking about? Well, there are four known forces of nature and apart from gravity, they are electromagnetic, weak and strong. Electromagnetic of force is, of course, the one we know very well, which is responsible for all kinds of phenomena. Uh, but also, there are two other forces which are kind of less visible. They are nuclear forces. The weak force, for example, is the one responsible for radioactive decay. The strong force is the force which binds quarks together in proton, neutron, and other elementary particles. So what's so important about these theories for me today is the fact that these three theories are, in fact, what's called gauge theories. A gauge theory is a term 
which this is used for a particular kind of quantum theory. And it turns out that three out of four fundamental theories of nature are gauge theory. And the most important thing to know about a the gauge theory is that a the gauge theory is always connected to a group. It's always based on a group. There's a group of symmetries in it, always. So what are they? In fact, here's a list. Electromagnetic force is a or uh, the, uh, the theory describing electromagnetic force is a gauge theory in which the group is called U1. And that's a fancy name for a group which was our first group in this lecture series, namely the circle group. Remember, the group of rotations of a round bottle. We discussed the fact that when we have a bottle, a round bottle, every rotation around the central axis will preserve its shape and position. And then we discussed the fact that if you look at the set of all such rotations, they can be represented by a circle. So circle was our first example of a group. And in fact, this is the group responsible for electromagnetic interactions. For the weak force, it's a group called SU2, which is like SU3 except in two dimensions. And finally, for the strong force, it is group, the group SU3. However, to confuse things a little bit, it's not the same SU3 as we discussed before in connection with Gelman's discovery. There are two SU3s which are relevant, or actually even more. Two, uh, several SU3s are relevant to strong interactions. The, uh, the one which is responsible for, uh, for the description of the cl and classification of particles is called the flavor SU3. And this one is called the gauge SU3. But nonetheless, it's the same group as you. It's, as a group, it is the same group, even though it is realized differently. So this is, a, this is what I would like you, I, I'm, not explain, I'm not going to explain what is a gauge theory, how it is constructed, and so on. It's a fairly sophisticated um, um, you know, mathematical theory. Uh, not too, too complicated, you can find out more if you like, if online, etc. But what I want you to remember is the fact that a gauge theory is always connected to a group. Now, these groups are actually called Lie groups. After a, uh, a Norwegian mathematician, Sophus Lee. And this indicates that it's not just a group, but also the, the, the group itself, the totality of points of this group, can be represented by a nice geometric shape. For instance, U1 is really a circle. And SU, SU2 we'll discuss in a bit, and SU3 has a certain description. So they are kind of nice, what mathematicians call manifolds. They're nice forms, nice geometric shapes. And such groups, which are at the same time, nice geometric shapes, are called Lie groups. So a Lie group is always at the foundation of every gauge theory. And now, what I would like to draw your attention to is what is called electromagnetic duality. But it turns out that these gauge theories sometimes possess a certain duality. What it means is that there are some unexpected links between different gauge theories. The simplest one of those is the duality, as the name suggests, which appears in electro electromagnetism. And this is something which goes back to the study of uh, electric and magnetic fields, which were undertaken by uh, the physicist Maxwell in the 19th century. And Maxwell was able to describe the behavior of uh, electromagnetic fields by a system of equations, which now carry his name, the Maxwell equations. And then when you look at these equations, these are differential equations, partial differential equations, which are very elegant, very beautiful. Very, they look they have a simple. They're not easy, but they're simple. They have a simple structure. If you look at these equations, then you find that in vacuum, when there is no matter present, there is a symmetry between electric and magnetic fields. You can exchange them, and the equations will stay the same. So this suggests that electric and magnetic forces somehow are dual to each other. It's very interesting because the way electric magnetic forces appear in our experience are very, very different. So later on, when these physicists realized that uh, the behavior of these forces at small, at small distances and high energies is governed by quantum theory, the question was posed, is there a duality like this, electromagnetic duality in quantum physics as well, in quantum theory of electromagnetism? And it turns out that there is a version of this electromagnetism for which such a duality is indeed present. Such duality is indeed present. So you see, now it's very interesting what this version is. It is called a supersymmetric version. 
Now, we have talked about symmetry, and that's already sophisticated now. <laughs> but it turns out that there is also such a thing called supersymmetry. And it sounds fancy, but in fact, it is something which has very precise mathematical sense, which is not much more sophisticated than the idea of symmetry itself. In quantum physics, it has to do with the fact that you have particles, elementary particles, which are called bosons, and you have elementary particles called fermions. For example, quarks are fermions, as, and as are other constituents of matter, like electron, neutrino, and so on. But the carriers of forces, such as the photon, which carries electromagnetic force, or um, the gluons, which carry strong interaction between quarks, are bosons. And so is the Higgs boson. By the way, it is called boson. So, of course, it is a boson. So, but these appear very different. They have very different properties. However, in the 1980s, physicists theorized that perhaps there could be a theory in which there would be kind of a good balance between the two, between bosons and fermions. And such theories are called supersymmetric. Now, we don't know whether our world is supersymmetric. The jury is still out. So for now, we don't have any experimental indications that supersymmetry is realized in nature. We do know that symmetry is realized. For instance, there is SU3 realized for quarks. There is also gauge group, which realized, is realized in standard model. But supersymmetry, not yet. However, the mathematical theories which are supersymmetrical can be studied mathematically. And it turns out that a supersymmetric version of electromagnetism does possess electromagnetic duality. So it's fascinating. There is something very special under this duality that electrically charged particles, like electrons, should be dual to magnetically charged particles, which are called monopoles. And those have never been observed. They were theorized by another physicist, uh, Paul Dirac, in the 30s, but never been observed. So there are some very fascinating questions which this idea of electromagnetic duality poses. But what I'm interested in is how this uh, plays out for theories other than electromagnetism. By the way, in my book, <laughs> I discuss electromagnetic duality. I give, an, um, um, as a metaphor, I use a borscht, the recipe for borscht, which is a, a soup in my, in, my, in my native country, Russia. And I basically explain that, you know, you can think of a quantum theory as a, as a recipe. You have certain ingredients, and you put them in a certain way. So from that point of view, duality would mean exchanging different ingredients. So, you, so you, suppose you have five potatoes and five onions. Then you can exchange them, and the recipe will stay the same. But if you have a recipe in which there are five potatoes and three onions, then it won't be the same. You see? So this is kind of, a, kind of a way to approach that, a metaphor to approach that. But I'm, what I'm really curious about is about this kind of duality in other gauge theories. And that's what physicists, that's a question the physicists asked in the 1970s. You see, if electromagnetism has this duality and it is a gauge theory, well, there are other gauge theories as well. Would they also have some sort of electromagnetic duality or not? That was the question. That was a big question they asked. Well, the answer turned out to be much more interesting than they expected. Because, you see, in the case of electromagnetism, as I just explained, under the duality, under the electromagnetic duality, which exchanges you know, electrons and positrons, electric force with magnetic force, and so on, the theory stays the same. In other words, it's, it's not like there is another theory which is dual to the original theory. It's the same theory is dual to itself. But what happens for general groups, or for gauge theories based on other groups, is totally, appears to be totally different. Namely, if you start with a gauge theory in which the group is G, the dual theory will not be the same in general, will not be the same. But it will be a theory with another gauge group. And what is that gauge group? Lo and behold, it is something which appears in the Langlands program and called the Langlands dual group. This was the first indication that there could be a link between quantum physics of gauge theories and the Langlands program. Because how else could the same thing, the dual group, appear? Right? So I have to say, I, in what I describe about the Langlands program, I have not explained. The Langlands group did not make an appearance. The well, Langlands group appears, perhaps, as, you can, as, you, as we delve deeper into the Langlands program, you would start seeing the 
the hints that there is some other group, that there is a duality of groups. And this, perhaps, is the most mysterious aspect of the language problem. I would say this is the single most mysterious element of the language program. The fact that there is this duality of groups. That in the, remember this correspondence we talked about. In the most general form of the correspondence, of the language correspondence, where you have objects from number theory on one side, objects from harmonic analysis on the other side, there would also be a group on one side. And then on the other side would not be the same group, but it would be the dual one. This is how Langlands came up with this idea. And then, 10 years later, from totally different considerations, by considering quantum gauge theories, not far away from the realistic theories of strong and weak interactions, or electromagnetism, the difference is that the theories they considered were supersymmetric, whereas the standard theories are not, physicists discovered the same dual group. It just leaped in, leaped in their eyes when they were uh, under, trying to understand how this, how this duality, how this electromagnetic duality would play out in non-abelian gauge theories. Or non-abelian meaning the, th the gauge theories based on more sophisticated gauge groups than the circle group, which we discussed before. The, sol the circle group, by the way, is self-dual. The dual group of the circle group, which is also called U1, is the same, U1. So that's why, in the case of electromagnetism, there is no change. The dual group is the same as the initial original group. But for other groups, like SU3 or SU2, the dual group is not the same. Now, it would take us quite a bit of effort to really explain the details of what the dual group is about. So instead of explaining this to you, I, will, I would like to do a demonstration. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. I would like to do demonstration. And this is something which is very beautiful, I think, which is called the cup trick. Have any of you seen this before? <laughs> Maybe some of Yeah? Okay. There are several people. But let me show it to you anyway. Um, so this is, here is how it goes. So here's a cup, okay? So no cheating. It's all, it's all real, you know. Here's a cup. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist my arm. So see, I'm turning the cup by 360 degrees. So I'm, I'm making a full twist. So it comes up here, okay? And now I would like to do one more twist. You would think that if I do one more twist, I will, my, my arm will get even more twisted and I might need a doctor. But in fact, look what happens. With the second twist, I untwist it. <laughs> Let me do it again. So the first one and the second one. Okay, but let's look for this camera now. The first one and the second one. <laughs> All right? So what does it have to do with dual groups? Well, what this has to do with is the connection between two specific dual groups. One is SO3, our dear friend, because it has to do with rotations of a sphere. And the other one is its dual group, which in fact is SU2, the gauge group of weak interactions. So the dual group So the dual group, the dual group of SO3 happens to be this dual group happens to be SU2. And this is a good illustration of that. And the reason is that the fact that the fact that there is such a that I can do this, that, that there is a, it means that there is a certain path on the group SO3, because, I mean, SO3 has to do with three-dimensional space and with rotations of the three-dimensional space. So, okay, I'm not going to give you a full explanation of how it's connected, but I'm going to tell you the result. The result is that the fact that there exists such a thing, that, there is, that I can have, I can do this, where this path, which is 360, rotation by 360, and yet my arm is twisted, right? But if I retrace that path and do it one more time, one more rotation, and I come back to it, I kind of untwist it, 
What it means is that there is a path on the group SO3, which is non-trivial. You cannot shrink it to a point. You cannot collapse it to a point. But if you traverse that same path twice, then you can. And there's some beautiful, there are some beautiful videos which you can find online, for example, following links in my book, um, where you can see how this works without, without uh, uh, twisting your arm, so to speak. You know. <laughs> there are other ways to see the same phenomenon. So now, but if that's the case, then topologists, our friends topologists, would tell us that for SO3, if there is such a path, it means that there exists another group which is twice as big as SO3, in which every path can be contracted to a point. And that group indeed exists, and that's the group SU2. Mathematicians call this a universal covering group of SO3. And it is the dual group, Langlands dual group of SO3. This, by the way, is very important in physics for other reasons, because uh, bosons and fermions that I mentioned earlier, they have special transformation properties. And bosons are described by SO3, and um, the fermions are described by SU, uh, SU2. So it is actually kind of, this duality is very important in physics. And likewise, for every other Lie group, there exists a Langlands dual group. And the most amazing thing is that, um, uh, that um, the electromagnetic duality, electromagnetic duality, exists or is predicted for gauge theories with groups other than U1, but then the dual theory of the theory with the gauge group G is not going to be the same theory, but the theory with the dual group. Okay, so that is a statement. So for example, if you start with a the gauge theory with gauge group SO3, the dual one will have gauge group SU2 and not SO3. Now, that made phys uh, mathematicians and physicists alike wonder what is going on. Why is it that in the, in the electromagnetic duality, you have the same Langlands dual group appear as what appears also in mathematics in the Langlands program, which seems to be totally unrelated. And this was a question which was already understood of, uh, in the 80s, because already in the late 1970s, this ideas of duality, the magnetic duality were um, uh, discussed and studied and um, by physicists such as uh, Goddard and Olaf, Knights and uh, Mantonin, and they are um, already saw the appearance of the dual group, even though they did not know about Langland's work. So they kind of rediscovered the Langland's dual group in their own way. But then in the 80s, some people recognize that the same objects appear in these two very different settings. So the question was posed, what is the relationship between the Langlands program and the electromagnetic duality? And guess what? That question was not answered for 25 years. It was not known. It was only answered about 10 years ago, more like 11 years ago. And in fact, uh, I, was, I was sort of privileged to be part of this, of this work that, um, that led to finding this connection, this links. You see, so, and this I think is uh, perhaps was this, the discoveries were probably one of the most important, um, most interesting discoveries of the um, sort of in mathematical physics, linking uh, mathematics and quantum physics. So what is the link? Where does the connection come from? And so this was, we were wondering about this. And so the, the crucial um, step was made 11 years ago in 2004 at a conference at the Institute for Advanced Study. That's the same institute where Einstein used to work, where Langlands was a professor, where Andre Ve used to work. We had a conference at, at the Institute for Advanced Study. I was one of the organizers. And the idea was to bring together mathematicians and physicists and to tell sort of our sides of the story and see if something clicks, if we can see what, where the connection could be. Because you see, it's like I said, you know, mathematics is sort of this, you know, for me, it's really this grand mystery, you know, it's, it's, a, it's this big detective story. And so we are oftentimes kind of the way we approach the subject is 
just like uh, true detectives, you know. We are just trying to assemble evidence and try to make sense of it. And so this was one example. And so the, um, let me, let me jump through this one. And uh, so this was uh, another, uh, my co-organizer of this conference, Edward Witten, is a physicist, uh, is a professor at the Institute for Advanced Study and a great uh, theoretical physicist who has also distinguished himself by making groundbreaking discoveries in mathematics. And in fact, for his work, including his work related to the language program, he was awarded last year the Kyoto Prize, one of the biggest prizes in Japan. And so, so Edward Witten, after the three days of the conference, he said, after the first two days of the conference, conference three days, and it was a small conference. It was even fewer people than we have here now. And we were really, but people really kind of intense and kind of really uh, deep discussion and uh, discussing all the, everything, and kind of put everything on the table and try to see what we can cook together. And on the third day, he said, I would like, I think I have some ideas. I would like to speak about this. And in the afternoon on the third day, he gave a talk in which he, he gave an outline of how the language program could be connected, linked to the electromagnetic duality. And this was, in fact, he was right. So at that time, it was more of a conjecture. It was more of a kind of raw ideas. But in retrospect, looking back, even though you know, we don't have any video recordings or audio recordings of those talks, but I have some notes and so on. So I, uh, in retrospect, I can see that, in fact, he was right, that everything he said actually worked out. But it took some years. It took some additional work to really get to the point of um, understanding this at a deeper level. And he, he, he has collaborated with other physicists and mathematicians, as, such as uh, Anton Kapustin, with whom Witten wrote the first paper on the subject. It was very long. I took a whole issue of a, of a journal in 2006. And with other physicists, and including myself, we have written a long paper also on the subject, where, in fact, we were able to so through all these works, Witten and collaborators were able to um, establish that link. Now, it doesn't mean that we solved everything and we were able to see everything, you know, and know everything, but it kind of more, it was, it was almost, almost more like opening a door to unraveling that story. And so what is a link? So what is a link here? How do we connect the two? That's... That's by itself a vast subject, a really vast subject, a vast topic, I would say. And so what I would like to say, I would like to just give you a few hints, because that's sort of like, it's almost like, you know, you, you know like those Russian dolls, you know, these toys. You, you open one, and then there is another inside, there's another side. So I kind of feel like I'm uh, opening them for you, you know. It, it's, it's a never, it, mathematics is a never-ending story, you know, that's what it is. And so if I have four lectures or I have five lectures or I have 10 lectures, I'll still be able to finish. And so this is one of the, of the subjects where, which I wish I could speak more about. But I'll have to just give you a few hints. Because, so what do we know uh, for now? We know that the Langlands program has to do with um, um, connecting things in number theory and harmonic analysis, right? What kind of things in number theory? Things like elliptic curves and counting problem, the counting problem for the cubic equations associated to elliptic curves. So for now, I have not explained how exactly Langlands program appears in geometry. I have not yet explained this. I have explained how symmetry appears in geometry. So this geometry kind of has been a part of these lectures, for sure. But I have not explained in detail how exactly um, geometry is relevant how exactly geometry is relevant to um, the Langlands program. So I will just give you an indication. And the indication is that a hint. I give you a hint uh, how it's connected. And the hint is that, you see, we have talked about the cubic equation, right? We have talked about the cubic equation. But we have talked about the cubic equation and its solutions only modulo a prime number. So where they're squarely within the setting of number theory. Because we talk about integers, 
but solving equations modular prime number. So it is really a question in number theory. So for example, let me write it again, y squared plus y equals x cubed minus x squared. So let's say we take this equation. And we looked for solutions, for example, x, y, 0, 1, 2, 4. So we look at the solutions modulo 5. Or we can look for solution modulo some other prime number. But it's not the only choice. We could also look for solutions in real numbers, you see. And in real numbers, there will be some curve on the plane, on the xy plane. Or we could look for solutions in the so-called complex numbers. So complex numbers, I have sort of mentioned when I, when I talked about um, the SU3. But I haven't really, dis we haven't really discussed complex numbers. But this is another interesting subject. There are, in addition to the real numbers, which we are very familiar with in our you know, lives, there are also complex numbers, which involve the square root of negative 1. And there is a, there is a mathematical theory, well understood mathematical theory of that. The point is that we could look for solutions of the same equation, but with values in complex numbers. And if we do that, so when we do we look at solutions modulo prime number, we get the counting problem. For every prime, there is some number of solutions. And lo and behold, they turn out to be coefficients, the coefficients of some modular form, which was the subject of the Chumur Tanyama Bay, right? But if we look for solutions in complex numbers, then we actually, the set of solutions can be organized into a nice geometric shape, specifically in this case, in the shape of a torus. Or to be completely precise, a torus without one point, which is kind of a point at infinity. So you see, it's a fascinating thing that mathematics also allows you to take one equation but consider solutions in different domains. And the result, and kind of like, you have a kind of a fork on the road. You choose to consider solutions modular prime numbers, you go to number theory. And you study those and so on. If you choose to look at, for solutions in complex numbers, you go to complex algebraic geometry, or more precisely, geometry, just to, to the realm of geometry, because you are studying a surface like this. And so this is the link. This is a missing link, which I have not had a chance to discuss yet, but which is also very important. There's a link between number theory and geometry. And if you follow that link, then you can, you can kind of transfer the ideas of the Langlands program to the realm of geometry. So that's how they appear in geometry. And then what Witten and collaborators did, really, what Witten and collaborators did was to see the connection between this, ty the type, of this type of geometric uh, patterns that the Langlands program predicted and dualities in quantum physics, the electromagnetic duality. So the connection between the Langlands program, the way we talked about it in these lectures, and electromagnetic duality is in two steps. First, we go from number theory to geometry. And second, we go from geometry to physics. And this is now how we see the link between physics and, and uh, quantum physics and the Langlands program, which kind of, you know, for me, which uh, for me, I would, I would like to say, you know, uh, I have already mentioned um, this quote from Young. He said, uh, how fascinating to see that mathematical theories which were born out of you know the um, this, this beautiful narrative um, referring to our understanding of of numbers and forms, how these mathematical theories turn out to be relevant to the world around us, right? And uh, there is a, another famous quote by another Nobel Prize winner, uh, Eugene Wigner who said, uh, who talked about what he called unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and the natural sciences. And you see, sometimes people say, well, why is it unreasonable? 
I mean, what's the difference between mathematics and physics? But there is a big difference. And I think now, after these lectures, you can appreciate this very much. Because, of course, the laws of nature are written in the language of mathematics as Galileo taught us, and as I mentioned at the very beginning of these lectures. But mathematical theories exist quite apart from physical theories. For instance, we saw that the standard model of elementary particles includes only three groups, three, uh, three groups, U1, SU2, and SU3, and no others. Whereas in mathematics, we can consider a gauge theory based on any gauge group, and there are infinitely many of those. There could be SU4, SU5, as you can imagine, and so on. Right? So mathematically, each of those theories makes perfect sense. But in physics, only those make sense which we find in nature. For physicists, only those theories are interesting, other ones which you can then test you know, on a machine like LHC and find some particles and so on. And if you have a theory which does not make a testable prediction or does not make a prediction which you can experimentally confirm, then you're not, it's not relevant to you. It's not so interesting. So you see this already difference between the two. Likewise with supersymmetry. Mathematically, the theories of, with supersymmetry are fascinating, very interesting, and sound. They are sound theories. They are um, non-contradictory. They are very interesting to study mathematically. But if supersymmetry is not realized in nature, is not realized in our universe, then these theories are not relevant to physics, you see. So there is a difference between the two. That's the first point. The second point is that many discoveries in physics were preceded by mathematical theories, which were nonetheless may, uh, you know, discovered for totally different reasons. I have already talked about SU3. When mathematicians discovered SU3, they could never imagine that this would be you know, related to fundamental blocks of nature, to quarks. This was a big surprise. But the theory was already there. Why did mathematicians discover it? Well, there is an explanation. I could explain it to you why. There was a logical, there was a very clear reason why mathematicians needed to develop it, but within the narrative of mathematics, without any external motivations, you see. And likewise, many other theories, even complex numbers, even complex numbers, they were developed by mathematicians, and it took many centuries to really understand and get a good grip on complex numbers, mathematicians were afraid of them. You know, this guy Cardano, about whom I talked about in the second lecture, who wrote a book containing solutions for the cubic and quartic equations, he called complex numbers mental tortures, or dealing with complex numbers, he called this mental tortures. And this is how we, it took a lot of work and a lot of effort by many, many generations of mathematicians to really overcome that fear and to really understand what complex numbers are. But until the beginning of the 20th century, they had no use in physics, essentially. I mean, they could be useful for some form, but there was no inherent reason to have them inside physics, because physics was about real numbers, but real spaces, right? And then quantum mechanics was discovered. And quantum mechanics takes place in what mathematicians call complex vector space, or Hilbert space. Complex me quantum mechanics cannot exist without complex numbers. All the you know, double slit experiment, all the interference patterns of particles interfering with themselves. This is only possible because the wave function describing an electron or a photon or another particle is complex valued, as values in complex numbers and not in real numbers. But there is not just the value, but there is also phase. And that's why they can sometimes en enhance each other and sometimes kill each other. Kind of, you know? So complex numbers are absolutely essential in quantum mechanics. But complex numbers were discovered by mathematicians who had no idea that the world is quantum and, in fact, that complex numbers would come into play in studying, complex, in, in studying uh, the physics at the, at, the high energy, at the high energy scales. And so this is what Eugene Wigner is talking about. The un almost unreasonable effect is why then, if this is the product of our imagination, why then it is so relevant to the world around us? And I think it's a very big question. And I think the very big question, which we should, we need to ponder more. We need to think more about, because it is really, it is a question which goes to the heart of our very existence. 
And it is also a question about the nature of mathematics, which is what I talked about at the very beginning. I talked about, you know, would, would aliens have the same math if we, met, if we met aliens? Do we discover mathematics or do we invent mathematics? So perhaps after what I have told you in these lectures, the answer is not so obvious. It's not so obvious because you can see these amazing connections which appear as the glimpses of this hidden reality. You know, who invent, did Galois invent Galois groups? Well, what if Galois did not finish that manuscript? Or what if, you know, it was lost after his death? Should we then expect that no one else would discover Galois groups? Well, I think it's much more reasonable to believe that someone else would have discovered. Galois would not have uh, received his due credit, would not have received his due credit, but someone else would have discovered the same concept because these concepts are inevitable. Because they are, they follow directly from, you know, from our knowledge of mathematics within the narrative of mathematics. And this is what has led some mathematicians to speculate that, in fact, mathematical ideas live in a, in a kind of a world quite apart from the physical world around us, in a kind of platonic reality. One of those mathematicians is a great logician, Kurt Gödel, perhaps the greatest logician of all times. Well, maybe Aristotle kind of comes close, but <laughs> one of the greatest logicians of all times, uh, the father of the so-called incompleteness theorems, which kind of turn upside down our understanding of mathematics and logic in that it explained to us that the notion of truth cannot, can never be formalized, can never be expressed by an algorithm. But he believed that mathematics exists quite apart, quite separately from, from the physical reality. And, from, and he said mathematical concepts form an objective reality of, its, of their own. Mathematical concepts form an objective reality of their own, which we cannot create or change, but only perceive and describe. And he actually went further that by using his insights in logic and his very deep understanding of the formal systems and algorithms and what we now call computers and machines, he actually wrote that the human mind infinitely surpasses the powers of any finite machine. And I think it's, it's something important to ponder again uh, in this day and age when we are, some of us are too quick to to kind of uh, to say that a human is just a specialized computer, a human is just a robot or machine, or there's no difference between a human and a robot. In a way, I would say that all these great mathematical discoveries that we have talked about in these lectures, such as Galois' works, such as Shimur Tanyama Vey conjecture, such as the Langlands program, such as the connection between language program and quantum physics, are not only, I would say, the monuments to, you know, to the great knowledge of man and humankind, but also human spirit. Because and when you know, in fact, the human story behind them, when you know what went into this and what sacrifices were made, You kind of feel, you kind of feel the creators and, and you, you, those who, can, who who let us see that beauty, who connected us to that hidden reality of mathematics. How, the, 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 the good news is that all of the stuff, all of that work that they have done, and for which they sacrificed themselves, no one can take it away from us. We all we own it. We all own it. The, you know, the United States Supreme Court has a made a decision in one ca in a case which is often cited that no mathematical formula can be patented. You know, Einstein's f famous formula E equals mc squared cannot be could not be patented. Einstein could not say it's my formula. No, it's my formula. I'm not going to give it to you. No, we all share it. If the formula is true. Of course, if it's not true, then it's not very interesting. But if the formula is true, 
then it is about something very fundamental. It's something about the world around us. It's about our consciousness. It's about who we really are. And therefore, we, it belongs to all of us. We all share it, you see. So there is this inherent democracy in mathematics that it really, we kind of all partake, even if we are not aware of it, even if you're not, we're not aware of all these wonders of mathematics that we have talked about in these lectures, they are all ours to share. Nobody can take them away from us. And nobody can stop us from delving deeper into the subject, from learning more about mathematics. And so to this, uh, this reminds me of the sort of kind of enclosing, enclosing of these lectures. And thank you for being such a, such a wonderful audience, I want to say. But uh, in closing, I would like to say, I would like to quote from, from Isaac Newton, another great scientist who, you know, paved the way for us to understand and to know. And he said that, you know, to myself, I seem to have only been like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself in now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. The great vast ocean of truth that's what mathematics is all about. And my dream is that uh, one day we will all awaken to this hidden reality. And then perhaps we'll all feel like children playing on the, on the seashore, discovering, you know, sharing and cherishing this beautiful knowledge. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yes. Einstein, who you mentioned many times, believed that there, his conjecture is there exists a grand unified theory in which there is only one single force in the universe, but it can be exhibited uh, at different length scale into the four different forces we know. And of course, he did not succeed in finding this grand unified theory when he was alive. Uh, physicists have been working, continue to work on this problem and there's a belief that maybe one way one can unify the gravitational force with the other three forces by using the idea of string theory. And Edward Witten, of course, is a well-known proponent of that. I was wondering what you think about the, uh, the future of uh, string theory as being the grand unified theory, or maybe uh, Langland's uh, program will be the uh, ultimate uh, grand unified theory. Great question. How much time do we have? <laughs> so, but uh, short answer, I think we are all kind of obsessed with this idea of, of getting the final theory because we would like to, wouldn't it be nice to have an explanation for everything? You know, this is one formula which will explain it all. I mean, it sounds so tempting. But then again, you know, if you think about it, if you actually were be able to find such a formula, I'm not sure you would actually be so happy about it because, you know, I, I think life would be kind of boring if we actually knew answers to everything. So to me, what makes mathematics so exciting is not just this marvels, this wonders that I talked about in these lectures. Like, you know, when you look at the Shimur Tanyamove conjecture that you have one problem in one area and then you solve it by methods in a totally different area. It's like, wow, it's amazing. Of course, 
but also the fact that there are so many things which are unknown. And so there are questions to answer tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and next year and so on. And so my belief in general is that knowledge is infinite. Our knowledge is infinite and it will never be expressed by one formula. It will never be expressed by one theory. It will never be expressed one by one equation. So, but we can approximate, we can get closer. We can get closer. It's like horizon line. We would like to get closer. So, from that point of view, I would say it's much, so in some sense, being a mathematician maybe gives me that perspective because I just, I see that infinity in some sense. I mean, infinity is something which you learn as a mathematician, the ideas of infinity early on. And so, and you realize this thing that, you know, yes, there is infinity for you as a mathematician. It is, infinity is something very real. For us mathematicians, it is something very real. Thanks a large, to a large extent to Georg Cantor, whom I mentioned earlier, the man who said that the essence of mathematics lies in its freedom. So you need to be free to be able to appreciate infinity. And that's what I think. Because the world around us is finite. We only see finitely many atoms in the observed universe. Any book has finitely many symbols. Any formula has finitely many symbols. You know? So how do we reconcile this? And I think this is a very deep question, not only mathematical, but metaphysical. So to, get, to, to go back to what you asked, I don't believe that we will find one day this one theory which will explain everything. It will explain everything within a certain range. Just like standard model is a great unified theory. It explains very well the, the, the world in a particular energy range that we, there could be some phenomena which we have missed, but it looks like we've pretty much, but it doesn't explain some other things. And even if we expand the range, perhaps there will be other questions. Likewise, string theory. String theory is beautiful mathematically for now, and my, some of my work is related to string theory. So it has been an incredible um, generator, string theory, of ideas, not only for mathematics, but also for theoretical physics. But it doesn't yet have experimental verification or it doesn't have any proposals for experimental verification. So there is this tension. It's almost like there is the world, you know, there is this abstract world of mathematics and then there is this world of physical reality. And so being a, a mathematical physicist, you kind of str straddle the two. And you kind of, you find um, how, uh, how uh, Newton said, a prettier shell sometimes on one side and some prettier pebbles on the other side. Sometimes you find them in the physical world, sometimes you find them in this abstract world of mathematics. But of course, we would like to have more and more theory. We'd like to unify. So I think Einstein's idea is the right one. I think that uh, unification of, for of force of nature is for sure a, a path to, to understanding more about the physical world. And we already know how to unify three forces of nature, at least within a certain range of energy. So gravity, of course, should come next. So we should, and we should aim at constructing quantum theory of gravity. But I think today we can be, to be honest, we should say nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows. And that's the beauty of it. So maybe we'll find out tomorrow, and maybe some of you will, will come up with the ideas. So that's my take on it. Uh, there's another area of mathematics that's about 60 years old, um, category theory. <clears throat> and it has a lot of the flavor of the Langlands program, as I understand yes. it, an attempt to find common structures in different areas yes. of math. Does that actually relate to the Langlands program in any way? Has anyone done that kind of work? Yes. So category theory, I actually mentioned in my first lecture when I talked about different ways to introduce uh, integers. That one way is by counting, but another way is by homotopy groups, by winding. And this idea of winding actually, or wrapping onto itself, is actually a categorical idea. A category is something where you don't only have objects, but also have relations between them. Uh, a great French mathematician, um, Alexander Grothendieck, was a big proponent of category theory, and he showed us the way of integrating uh, category theory into areas like algebraic geometry and so on. And it is, in fact, the language of the Langlands program, it seems, in that when we move the ideas of the Langlands program from number theory to geometry, categorical, um, categorical framework shows up naturally, appears naturally, and seems to be the right language. So yes, the answer is that absolutely category theory is very much relevant to, Langlands, to the Langlands program. Anyone else? 
Yes. Yeah, one more and one more. Excuse me, Professor. Obviously, you know a lot of physics. And uh, the question I have is, to what extent should mathematicians know physics in order to make them great communicators? To what extent should matter? mathematicians so know physics? Someone like G.H. Uh, Addy, Addy thought uh, mathematicians don't need to know physics. Right. And, um, and the <laughs> recent, uh, I mean, many discoveries in math have been motivated right. by uh, practical questions in physics. Well, you know, that's a very good point. But I, my, my first answer is not to listen to authorities on, uh, on questions like this. Because what was right for G.H. Hardy may not be right for you or for me or somebody else. G.H. Hardy, uh, is a brilliant man, and also uh, who wrote this beautiful book, a Mathematician's Apology, which was very important for mathematicians. But also his point of view is purposely, I would say, he is purposely a little bit exaggerating things. Like he also claimed that mathematics should not be useful or is not useful. But then, ironically, some of his work is being used in applications. So, you know, uh, you should be careful what, what you say, you know. Um, but I can say, I can speak for, uh, about myself. In my work, I have been driven by, in terms of choosing what to work on, I've been driven by, driven by my intuition, my aesthetic sense. Like I said uh, early on, when I was a kid, I was very interested in quantum physics, right? But then, Evgeny Evgenievich kind of converted me into math because he showed me that mathematics was at, you know, the foundation of physics. And yet, most recently, I have been working with physicists such as Witten on you know, developing these ideas relating to the language program and quantum physics. So I think for each of us, it's like that, that we just choose. So I don't have a recipe. I'm not sure how much my physics everybody should know. I think it could be useful for people working in particular areas today. But maybe in 10 years, it will not be so useful. So I think it, it is a, really a question for each of us. And it is a question where there is no algorithm. There is no formula. It's really where you have to kind of follow your intuition. OK, we have time for one more. Um, I'm, I, just, I think this is more of like a general question, like with you know, how education works in terms okay. of math. Look at math, they see math as something that's very formulaic and something in which you have to try to crunch out like a distinct answer to something. How, what can we do to sort of stimulate people at a young age to not feel that math is this really formulaic mm -hmm. way of think, uh, you know, like solving, you know, let's say, you know, solve that x. You know, yeah, x. like a formula for quadratic equations yeah, or something. Like memorize. That. And then the point is you memorize and you forget after the exam. Yeah, exactly. And how that's right. People to actually try to explore and to sort of delve into like finding sort of the unknown, yes. you know, starting at the young age. We think a lot of people are sort of swayed away from math, especially in this country and uh, like in STEM fields in general. That's right. It, you know, it's a universal problem. Yeah. Absolutely. No, this is a, a, a great question. And, you know, I feel that the best way is to expose our kids to these marvels and wonders of mathematics, which, you know, I talked about in these lectures. Because if you think, you know, if you look at things like symmetry, things like, you know, equation, uh, like in clock arithmetic. Here are just two examples. They are very elementary. You can explain symmetries to, I, and I have, I have gone to schools. I have gone to schools and I talk to 10, 11, 12 year old kids and I explain these ideas. And honestly, they understand them even faster than adults because they're not yet, they have not been told yet that they will not be able to understand, you see. So, <laughs> which is the problem for us, I think, as we grow up because we start believing that we won't understand and then we're blocking ourselves. So. But for kids, it's, it's, it's still possible because, you know, um, to, to show it to them and they will get it and they will be excited. Now, not all of them will become mathematicians, but they will have the big, see the big picture the way we know about the big picture of art or literature, or poetry, or music, and so on, right? So I think this is the way and, you know, to, to, to be able to, to, to show them. But of course, for that, you need to have teachers who know it themselves and who, are, who love the subject. Unfortunately, not all teachers of mathematics today in schools, they love the subject. The ones who, who love what they do, they find ways to, to, um, to excite their students. But you know, in some sense, we have no choice. I think that the, the world is moving so rapidly and mathematics is becoming integrated into our lives at an accelerated pace that in some sense, if we don't get our act together in terms of our math education, I think we'll be in big trouble. So I, this kind of gives me hope that I think we will of humanity will force itself to overcome that fear and to really connect to 
mathematics as an integral part of our cultural heritage. Well, I want to say uh, thank you so much for being such a great audience. It's been such so much fun to, uh, to do these lectures and to see so many, you know, uh, you know, I, f I feel that great energy from you and uh, interest and excitement. So thank you so much.